may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, you might have seen this before on a laminated card in a Christian bookstore or maybe in the back of a Bible at a, at a hotel room or maybe just in a pamphlet like this one. It's a listing of passages to look up in the Bible when you are in need of God's word. If it were on a card, maybe on the left-hand side, you would see the different situations in life, like when you worry or when you feel alone or when you struggle with temptation. And then on the right side of the card would be a Bible verse uh, that would uh, have a message that would uh, help you out under those particular situations. For instance, when you are worried, you would be directed to go to 1 Peter 5, 7, and there you would read, you know, cast all your anxieties on God because he cares for you. Now, this is a quick, easy way to find a Bible passage that speaks to you. I mean, really, the last thing you want to uh, open the Bible to and read when you are worried would be the striking of Ananias and Sapphira dead um, by God or God sending bears to kill 42 children uh, who were mocking the prophet Elisha. So we don't want to just randomly open the Bible uh, because the verse may not necessarily speak to the concern that you have. So this is a good thing to have these types of Bible verses. And while this can be comforting and helpful, though, there is a difficulty in that sometimes people never get beyond this kind of reading of the Bible. They never find themselves entering into a deeper, richer story that Scripture has to offer us. In fact, in this situation, Christianity can become something that it was never intended to be, just a private, personal religion. It becomes something that um, you turn to not when uh, you enter the world, but rather when you retreat from the world in a personal prayer or in a, in a devotion. And uh, for picture here, I have a couple of monasteries, uh, uh, very isolated, very far away from the world. And, and so our faith becomes very private as, uh, as we retreat from the world. But unlike the monastery in our personal life, sometimes as we retreat away from the world, God becomes something like our best friend, a person who supports us when times get tough, someone who helps us accomplish our goals and our plans to fulfill our dreams. He almost, in that sense, becomes our little genie. And, uh, and, and if that is the case, the problem is, is that we have reversed the roles with God. Rather than us being servants in God's kingdom, God becomes a servant in our kingdom. Rather than us being brought into God's greater story, God is brought into our story. Over the summer, we have been in the middle of a sermon series that has turned our attention to God's greater story. And as we have learned in this sermon series, the main actor in the story is not us but rather it is God. God is the one who was there at the beginning creating this world and and all of the cosmos that we live in, and God will be the one who will be there at the end, and he will bring about a new recreation of this world. And in between the beginning and the end, we have heard that God is here with us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, working in love and ruling over ruins, as we discussed last week. Well, at this point in our sermon series today, we are going to see how God's greater story involves a greater people. God's greater people. That would be you. While God certainly is present um, there for every individual person in private 
individual prayer. God's vision is much more than that personal God. Because God has come in Jesus Christ not only to save you and each and every person in the entire creation, but he also came to join you together with a people. A people who live by and within the promise. And to live for the purpose of his kingdom. So this is what Paul reveals to us today. Let us take a look at um, God's word in this regard. As you listen to our text this morning, you are going to realize that we're, going to, we're actually going to catch Paul in a very private moment himself. Paul is engaged in prayer, and his prayer is powerful and very personal and very painful. Because Paul is praying for the lost brothers, his Jewish brothers. So let's take a look. He says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul here is concerned for his kinsmen, his brothers, the Jewish people. It was five years ago from the time that Paul wrote this. The Jewish people were actually expelled from Rome. Because see, in Rome there had been some civil unrest. And so the emperor Claudius, uh, attempting to maintain law and order, expelled the Jews out from Rome and they had to leave. Now, when Claudius died, the expulsion died with him. And so, at the time of this writing, the Jewish people were now returning back to Rome. And so, the question that Paul had as he was writing to Rome is, how would the church receive them? You know, this Christian faith, which had begun as a a movement of faith, started predominantly with Jews who converted over and became Jewish Christians. But now, since the Jews had left and the church had grown in Rome, it was primarily of Gentile believers. And so Paul was worried. He had two concerns. He was concerned about the Jews who did not believe in Jesus Christ. And he was also concerned about the Gentiles who may not see any reason to care about these Jewish people as they moved back into the Roman community. If we were to go back earlier in this letter that Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 3, he asked a very important question in this regard. Um, You know, in chapter 3, he revealed the fact that we all have sinned and we all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so he asked the question, well, what then is the advantage of a Jew? And we would expect him, based on that discussion, to say that there's nothing We are all sinful. We all fall short of the glory of God. And it is only through the grace uh, and and faith in Jesus Christ uh, that we can come to be with him in heaven on that last day. But surprisingly, that's not Paul's answer. What is the advantage of being a Jew? Well, back in in chapter 3, he states the following. He says, well, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. And so there is that blessing there that, that comes from the Jews. And then he continues this discussion in chapter 9. In chapter 9, in our reading today, he continues. He says, well, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever." Amen. So I think Paul's point is to these Romans, primarily at this point Gentile Romans, is don't ignore the Jews as they return. But while that's his point, I think we can actually analyze Paul as uh, at this moment in his life. Uh, with that context in mind, Paul is engaged here in a moment of prayer, a very personal a very private prayer 
And yet, did you notice that this prayer that he has is not all about Paul and his personal desire and his personal gain. Rather, his prayer is wrapped up in this larger story 